Hello everyone in Cardio Minds channel and we are starting today a new type of heart failure and discussing how to manage it distinct of course from the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction it is heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction as we mentioned before that the heart failure is not a single pathological diagnosis but rather it is a clinical syndrome consisting of cardinal symptoms of heart failure plus minus signs due to structural or functional abnormality or both of them resulting in elevated intracardiac pressure and or inadequate cardiac output sometimes we abbreviate them as backward failure or forward failure at rest and or during exercise we remember also this table explaining the three subtypes of heart failure and we mentioned that signs may not be present in the early stages of heart failure and in optimally treated patients that's why we usually depend on the symptoms of heart failure we are going to focus today on the second type which is heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction which is diagnosed by symptoms plus minus signs and an LV ejection fraction between 41 to 49. It's a previous name was mid-range ejection fraction but we don't usually use this terminology nowadays. The question that we should ask ourselves what about the evidence of structural heart disease like increased lift exercise, lift ventricular hypertrophy, or features of elevated LV filling pressures. Are they essential for diagnosis, or we only depend on the symptoms plus minus signs and the range of ejection fraction between 14.1 to 49? These features make the diagnosis more likely, of course, but they are not mandatory for diagnosis if there is certainty regarding the measurement of LV ejection fraction, they are more essential for the diagnosis of preserved ejection fraction type, which we are going to discuss in the next video. We should also emphasize that this group can include patients whose ejection fraction improved from less than or equal 40% to more than 40, or declined from more than or equal 50% to less than 50. And so the distinction of heart failure subtype by which the patient is diagnosed is a dynamic process depending on the variation of ejection fraction over time and with the medical treatment. Another fact that we should mention that most of the patients with heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction have features that are more similar to the reduced ejection fraction rather than the preserved ejection fraction subtype. In which features? They are more commonly to be males, younger age, more likely to have coronary artery disease, and less likely to have AF or non-cardiac comorbidities. However, ampullatory patients with mildly reduced ejection fraction have a lower mortality than those with reduced ejection fraction, and so their mortality is nearer to those with preserved ejection fraction. So they are more similar to the reduced ejection fraction in the natural history and risk factors, and more similar to the preserved ejection fraction in the rate of mortality. The most important point that we need to discuss today is the pharmacotherapy. Is there a difference in the treatment for mildly reduced ejection fraction from those with reduced ejection fraction? So far, no prospective randomized controlled trials have been performed exclusively in patients with heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. So what is the source of data for the evidence of pharmacotherapy? Some data can be obtained from the subgroup analysis of trials in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but none of which have met their primary endpoint. That's why we are going to find that the evidence may be weaker for those patients with mildly reduced ejection fraction than patients with reduced ejection fraction. The only class 1 medication for the subtype is the diuretics. They have a class 1 recommendation in patients with congestion and heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction to alleviate symptoms and signs. And of course it makes sense. Any patient with heart failure symptoms regarding subtype, diuretics are a cornerstone for rapid symptomatic relief. But the rest of medications for those with mildly reduced ejection fraction are class 2b. For example, an ACE inhibitor may be considered for those with mild reduced ejection fraction to reduce risk of hospitalization and death, but no specific trials of ACE inhibitor have been performed in those patients. The PEPCHF trial, which was conducted in patients with preserved ejection fraction to test pirandoprel, 
included patient with an ejection fraction more than 40 but with no outcomes according to LV ejection fraction range. And those patients mostly have coronary artery disease, hypertension, or post-MI LV systolic dysfunction. The same level of evidence for angiotensin receptor blockers as also there are no specific trials for ARP in those patients. But in a retrospective analysis of the SHARM P trial, it showed that candiosartan reduced the number of hospitalization for heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction and with similar trend for the cardiovascular and all cause mortality. And also the patients here showed coronary artery disease, hypertension or post MI LV systolic dysfunction as the most probable cause. Also the same level of evidence for beta blockers, but there is something additional in this case, that in an individual patient data meta-analysis of the landmark beta blockers trials, it suggested similar reduction in cardiovascular and all-cause mortality for patients in sinus rhythm with heart failure with reduced and mildly reduced ejection fraction. So there may be substantial benefit of beta blockers in those patients. Also, many patients with mildly reduced ejection fraction may have another cardiovascular indication for beta blockers, for example, rate control for AF or ischemic heart disease, and so you would get benefit from the rate control. So beta blockers may be beneficial in patients with heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction. And the same level of evidence for MRA. But in a retrospective analysis of the TOPCAT trial in patients with ejection fraction more than 45%, spironolactone reduced hospitalization in those with an ejection fraction less than 55. As here, the spironolactone has also a diuretic effect, so it may have symptomatic benefits. And there was a similar trend for cardiovascular mortality, but not for the all cause mortality. So the MRA may have substantial diuretic benefits that can help in symptomatic control. And the last example here is the Sacobatrel Vasartan or the ARNI, as also it has a class 2B recommendation. But in the Paragon heart failure trial, which included patients with ejection fraction more than 45%, the ARNI compared to Vasartan reduced the likelihood of the primary composite outcome of cardiovascular death and total heart failure hospitalization in those with an ejection fraction less than 57 percent. Moreover, further data from a combined analysis of the Paradigm Heart Failure and Paragon Heart Failure trials showed that ARNI compared to other forms of RAS blockers has a beneficial effect, especially on hospitalization for those with mildly reduced ejection fraction. And so we are speaking here also about substantial benefit of the ARNI in those with mildly reduced ejection fraction, especially for the hospitalization. And so we can have a conclusion that all these medications have a class 2B in those with mildly reduced ejection fraction and this doesn't mean that we don't use them, we can start them in those patients, but so far the evidence for them is weak but may be accentuated by further clinical data or trials. What about the digoxin? Is it beneficial in those patients? In the DEG trial for those with mildly reduced ejection fraction in sinus rhythm, there was a trend to fewer hospitalization with digoxin, but no reduction in mortality, and there may be a trend to excess cardiovascular death due to the risk of digoxin toxicity, and so there are insufficient data to recommend its use in those patients, but it is not contraindicated but no solid evidence. And regarding evapradine, there are also insufficient data for evapradine in those with mildly reduced ejection fraction to make in recommendations for it. But of course, if we want to achieve optimal rate control, which cannot be obtained by the highest tolerated dose of beta blockers, in this case, we can use evapradine, but no sufficient data on its benefits. What about CRT? In post hoc analyses of the landmark CRT trials, they suggested that CRT may benefit those with ejection fraction more than 35% as the cutoff point of course for the ejection fraction in those trials was less than or equal 35%. However, those trials were abandoned in those with mildly reduced ejection fraction due to poor patient recruitment and so there is no evidence for CRT 
in those with mildly reduced ejection fraction and still the cutoff point for ejection fraction is less than or equal 35% to think of the candidacy of this patient for CRT implantation and we discussed this issue in the last video. And what about ICD? There are also no substantial trials of ICDs for primary prevention of ventricular arrhythmias for those with mildly reduced ejection fraction and the trials conducted more than 20 years ago did not show benefit from ICD for secondary prevention of ventricular arrhythmia in those patients and so the conclusion that there is insufficient evidence to advise CRT or ICD therapy in patients with heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction so the device therapy is not conclusive in those patients and mostly it is not used as a treatment line. And so at the end of our video today what are our take home messages? The patients with heart failure with mildly reduced ejection fraction are more similar to those with reduced ejection fraction regarding natural history and pharmacotherapy but without strong evidence due to insufficient data. That doesn't mean that we don't use these medications that we discussed before for those patients with mildly reduced ejection fraction but we may need to have further stronger data to validate their benefit and reuse. Thank you very much for watching this video and wait next week as we are going to discuss the other type which is preserved ejection fraction.